I am Geoffrey Villardoen in the Roman Campaign from the Stainless Steel Titanium mod for Medieval 2 Total War Kingdoms. We are in 1108 and our relations with the Saracens are poor, which should not come as a surprise. A new Dromon has been built in Constantinople. There have been repairs on the wooden palisade of Chersonesus and the castle walls of Sebastia. Two babies have been born in the royal family. We remain the most populous kingdom around. Manuel Butomitis is now Manuel the Chivalrous, much loved by the people of Crimea for stopping the riots in Chersonesus. Some Contarati have been recruited in Xenope and some cavalry in Arta. Romanos Lascaris has risen to the rank of Emirarchis, a general. Bishop Timotheus is now Patriarch of Constantinople. Here is His Holiness, our new Patriarch Timotheus. A most honorable victory, my noble lord! Our courage has prevailed! These lands are yours, my lord! No more words! Draw your sword! Emperor Alexius Komnenos captures the castle of Iamboli, Iambul in Turkish or Bulgarian or some other language. Its rebel commander had been out on a raid and so the castle was taken without a fight. A master stroke from our emperor. More units are being recruited. Alexius Paleologus, also a historical character, the son of Georgius Paleologus has come of age. Theodorus Vatagis is now a Heliarchist, that is, a colonel. A Hungarian merchant strikes, fortunately without consequences. Our diplomat Marianus Procopius has presented himself before the Pope at the Vatican with an offer of an alliance. The Pope rejects the offer. Our relations with the Pope have deteriorated after we had made a pact with the Cumans and the job of our diplomat was to wheel and deal until the relations were significantly improved. Indeed, by the end of the protracted negotiations, relations have become perfect, which is as good as it sounds. We are now allied with the Cumans, Hungary, the Rus and Georgia. We are in the top five factions overall and territorially the largest. We have a very healthy family tree thanks to the virility of our imperial family. Anna Komnena is only 26. Her son, Alexius Briennius, is 8. We also have an Isaacius Komnenus growing up. Our co-emperor, Ioannis Komnenos, is only 23. Alexius Paleologus, who has just come of age, is 14 years old. He has a younger brother, Lucianos Paleologus, so the Paleologus family seems to be here to stay. Constantinus Angelus has been betrothed to Ekaterini Lagudis, so another royal line looks set to continue. Some Aconteste have been recruited in Dyrrachion. Their skins are made by Paleologus, and the one on the right wears full-length armor called a Lorician, held together by the characteristic Byzantine leather harness. Nice work there by Paleologus, giving him some rep at TW Center. The Moors continue to grow and are now again the largest empire. The Hungarian merchant strikes again, once again unsuccessfully. Matthäus Kondralistus is in the Holy Lands, negotiating an alliance with the Kingdom of Jerusalem. The Crusaders refuse the alliance, but the discussions continue until our relations with the Crusaders become perfect. 
Another diplomat negotiates various agreements with the Russians until relations with the Rus also become perfect. Romanos Laskaris attacks some rebels near Smyrna. He defeats them in battle and restores order in his province. Georgius Paleologus, accompanied by his son Alexius, besieges Skodra in the area of modern Albania. Skodra is the Albanian and Turkish name of the town. Skodra is defended by Bulgarian rebels. The town is torn and easily falls to the two Byzantine generals. Autoresolve is the way to go since most units in the campaign are expendable cannon fodder whose lives are of no consequence. A Khoresmian diplomat appears before our Caesar and Lord Chancellor Nikiforus Briannius. Noble one, we have something for you. The Khoresmian envoy offers trade rights which are happily granted. If Allah is willing, we will reach more. You would speak of something more. But refuses our offers of an alliance which would have been useful against the Turks. I see little, my people. There is something else you wish to propose then? Enough of this for now. The ungrateful Bulgarian inhabitants of Skodra have rioted. We have a new bishop, Sebastos Tornitsis. Eustathius Lampinos is now also a general. Princess Theodora has gained a charming handmaiden as a faithful companion which turns out to be neither good nor bad. We have failed to annex Olesche, the human name of Odessa, which is at present a rebel town, but the Rus are interested in it and it is too far away for us. The might of the Moors is growing. Skoda is renamed into Avalon, actually the Byzantine name was Kodra, Avalon was further south, my bad. Yes, Lord, Your Majesty. Alexius Paleologus takes charge of Dyrrachion. As Georgius Paleologus begins to rebuild Skodra, which greatly pleases the town's inhabitants, and so the civil unrest ends. Adrianos, Komnenos Ducas, begins the construction of a church in Thessalonica. A wall and various other buildings are ordered in Avalon. Mikhail Opsikinos desired the hand of our princess Theodora in marriage, but our princess is looking for a foreign prince to marry. Our imperial council proposes to take Palermo from the Normans of Sicily, an interesting idea worth considering. Relations have worsened with Genoa, that sad bunch of stuck-up merchants that they are. Our quartermasters report a strengthening of the garrisons across our empire. A mustering hall has been constructed in Arta. The wooden fence around Skodra has been repaired. That must have been the laugh of the day. And 
What do you burn apart from witches? Four witches! Wood! So, why do witches burn? Because they're made of wood. Good! <laughs> it will keep the cockroaches out of town, maybe. Why not build the wall out of stone? A much cheaper and more plentiful material that cannot be set alight by besieging armies. Did the locals have better use for stone than to build things with it? And so, as a blasphemer, you are to be stoned to death. Oh, Rayoff, we haven't started yet. Come on, who threw that? Who threw that stone? Come on! Sorry, I thought we started. Go to the back. Always one, isn't there? A big uh, wooden palisade is planned next. The future is in wood. Two years have passed already, we are in 1110, and the Moors remain the mightiest power on Middle Earth that is in the Mediterranean. Dyrrhachion is under siege by the Normans of Italy. Our envoy to the Cumans spends the season wrangling some deals that make our standing with the Cumans rise from reasonable to very good to outstanding and eventually to perfect. Our envoy to Venice is less successful, but at least our standing with the Crusaders and the Pope remains perfect. Alexius Comnenus puts Tarnovoi, Byzantine city previously known as Nicopolis, under siege. Tarnovoi falls, the captives are pardoned, and the city is peacefully occupied. Bulgarian brigands helped soar up our forces, having proved superior to the Byzantine infantry who were just petty thieves afraid to kill chickens, let alone to rob people. Nonetheless, brigands as mercenaries have a high upkeep, so they were disbanded. Georgios Paleologus has also hired some mercenaries, Bulgarian archers among others, and marches to relieve Dyrrhachion, defended by his son Alexius. Seeing his father arriving with reinforcements, Alexius Paleologus sallies out with the garrison of Dyrrhachion. Yes! Yes! Crossing for battle! The Normans have a sizable army under their Prince Roger and a general also called Roger, Roger of Autovilla. The troops are assembled. Prepare for battle. So the battle begins as the reinforcements of Georgius Paleologus arrive. The first unit to move towards Dyrrhachion are these mercenary archers. They are firing are the two enemy generals that have already killed several of the men in the bodyguard of Roger of Autovilla. So you can see here on the right, Roger of Autovilla has only left with about five bodyguards. And here at the front is the Norman Prince, Prince Roger, or Rugeru in uh, Sicilian, in modern Sicilian. Of course, in those days, the Normans did not speak Sicilian. So here are those at Crete. This is a very beautiful unit that Antonius made. Uh, the Akrita were mainly border guards on the eastern border. They were often Armenians or Saracens, not all of them Romans, not all of them Byzantine. They probably were not available in this part of the world, but in any case, they are in the game.
their javeliners, they also armed with swords here, they have been caught up and uh, they lost several of their men, they lost about a half a dozen of their men. And they are throwing javelins at the bodyguard of the Norman Prince, which seems impervious to the javelins of the lost one horseman here. And so rather foolishly, the enemy prince continues to gallop after the uh, javeliners. Here, another one in his bodyguard has been slain. And to be fair, he charges with such a speed, he manages to catch up with the uh, creator. So he's caught up with them the second time. I've slowed it up a little bit so we can admire the beautiful skins of these units, the Norman bodyguard, as well as the uh, beautifully made uh, creator. Here again the Akrita, the uh, Norman bodyguard keeps losing men. There are probably about a dozen left at this point. And the Akrita are skirmishing, running rings around them, throwing more javelins. The rest of our army is uh, slowly marching towards Durakion. The garrison of Durakion is uh, sallying out and they are assembling in front of Durakion, in front of the walls. In the meantime, our two generals, Alexius and Georgius Paleologus, are moving towards the enemy prince. They've uh, noticed that he has separated himself from the rest of his army and uh, they are considering launching an attack, not at the moment. At the moment as skirmishes are active, throwing more javelins, uh, shooting arrows, mostly missing. Another one of the bodyguards of the Roman prince has been slain. Another one has been injured, he lost a hit point. The normal prince does not give up somehow. He remains separated from the rest of his army. Our skirmishers are doing a good job irritating him, forcing him to counterattack. And so here he is again, once again, charging our javeliners, our Krite. Creator have been skirmishing very successfully. They've lost a few men every time they get caught up. A couple of them die, but overall, they've killed more of our enemy than they have uh, lost among their men. And so, once again, the two enemy generals charge our missile cavalry, our skirmishing cavalry. Roger Ofata Villa is already injured. Here are our mercenary archers. You can see the rest of our army has sallied out. And now our two generals are taking matters 
on their hands, so now they are counter-attacking. They attack Roger of out of Villa. And their charge is such that they run through the enemy bodyguard. They don't seem to have killed anybody. But now they're engaged in melee and uh, Roger of Villa only has a couple of bodyguards with him, so it's a lost cause for him. He's charged by the second enemy general here. Now he's being completely surrounded. The battle is in our favor. If we remain true and wholehearted, victory will be ours. And the enemy general Roger of Alto Villa has been slain. So what you saw here was actually a true Byzantine tactic. So the skirmishers attacked first on all the enemy, and if the enemy cavalry countercharged, then the lancers, who were called defensors, countercharged the enemy. The enemy king is slain. Were the enemy, but no less than dead for that. We must press our advantage. The enemy king, Roger of Sicily, has been slain. So all that remains now is the Norman army, which uh, could still be a handful, but. Uh, as usual, infantry is not very good in this game, and so they somehow manage to get themselves in trouble. They are moving away from the wall, from the armies, they maybe decided to retreat, abandon the field of battle, and as they retreat, our two generals charge their rear, and uh, they are massacring them. All you need is generals in this game. The other units are like decoration. That sounds a bit harsh, but it's not far from the truth. And so here's the uh, enemy infantry that is just running for their lives, being charged in the rear by our generals. The spears are useless against these bodyguards, which are more than tanks. battle is in our favor. If we remain true and wholehearted, victory will be ours. I'm fairly sure that you could kill an armored horse with a spear. I don't think it would be so difficult. And so this unit has tried to stand their ground to their credit. And uh, now they're engaged in a melee with our general, nonetheless, the remaining army is simply retreating. They're being taken prisoner here by our missile cavalry. Mounted archers! Attack! The death of the enemy general has uh, broken their morale. Most of the enemy units are now on the run. Well, this unit has counterattacked. They are attacking one of the uh, bodyguard units. Oops, they changed their mind. So they're going to get charged in the rear. While wow, they are disorganized. And they are murdered and they run and are being cut down or taken prisoner.
another spearman unit, unit of spearmen was coming to their aid a little too late. Now the other unit of spearmen have been encircled, they've been attacked in the rear by our skirmishing cavalry. They are also broken now and they are being taken prisoner. So the enemy army just runs, they just retreat the route, they've lost their spirit, they lost any courage they had. Only half the enemy force remains. Here's a glorious general in red. Our two general's bodyguards are massacring the retreating enemy. The bodies of our enemy bodies of the enemy soldiers are strewn on the battlefield. You can run like this for a hundred meters or two hundred meters. Okay. They ran out of breath, they seem to be slowing down. They are mercenaries of our own. They are firing at this Norman unit. And the Normans incensed by the fire from our men decide to attack. But they get charged in the rear, and that's the end of that unit. Just one more Norman unit remains on the battlefield. The battle is in our favor. If we remain true and wholehearted, victory will be ours. Here it is. Praise the Almighty! Our enemy has lost his stomach to fight! We must push our advantage! And they break when they realize that they have an entire Byzantine army in front of them and our general in the rear. Now they're running for their lives. Not what one might have expected at first. After the two enemy generals were slain in battle, the rest of the army simply disintegrated. So just that unit still left just a handful of men running for their lives. All of Christendom will be awed by the victory we have won here today. We have won a decisive victory with a loss of only 25 men. Our two generals destroyed the entire enemy army. Sir, I have a plan, sir. Maybe we should make an army of generals.
if we place two stages surprise attack man? Yes, no! The prisoners are ransomed and retreat to the Norman ships that had been moored on the nearby shore. Thank you for watching.